The topic that I've picked to talk to you about, the challenge with change. I'm not used to standing underneath such an enormous uh, screen, so I'm just going to move over to this side a little. One of the biggest things that happens in projects um, constantly that causes issues, I'm sure all of you will agree, uh, is change. And there are lots of people here today who have tens of years experience and who are very senior in the, in the industry, and lots of people who are just starting out on their careers um, as well. So I'm going to try and cover the topic uh, in, its, in its, not in its entirety, but to give some examples of some of the typical challenges that changes can cause on a project. Um, to briefly tell you a little about me, I'm by original background a mechanical building services engineer and I um, currently run the driver business globally and we look after uh, projects all over the world, all different sizes, mainly in the claims and dispute resolution space and the other half of our time we spend on prevention. So by looking at projects that have gone wrong, we try and apply what we've learned to new projects to make sure that uh, what's happening in the future is going to go much more smoothly, hopefully. So um, uh, that's the background to my approach to these kind of topics. I also, I'm not going to show you any magic software that could change your life and make all this go away and be much better, okay? If, if anyone ever does invent a magic button that can deal with all this stuff, I will happily go and find something else to do with my days. I don't know of it. it. It's basically hard work, common sense, and understanding the documents that you've got before you. Um, I'm going to carry on. There's a few people filing in, but... Uh, just give you my agenda there. I'm going to start with the basics of what actually is a change. You would not credit the number of people that come and visit our business and ask for help to resolve something. And when you actually ask for the detail of what is change, they have fundamental misunderstandings about it. You wouldn't credit it. But that's a very common thing. Uh, typical contract processes, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on those because they're not terribly interesting, but the fact is there are two clear different approaches to evaluating changing contracts. Volume and value, predicting the type of change that you might have on a project, is that actually important? And if it catches you out, if it changes, if the type of change changes, should you do something about it? Sequential change, when, you know, should you break things down or should you roll them up? And when is it appropriate to do that? I'm going to talk about that. Some strategies for dealing with change and then a couple of conclusions, after which I'm very happy to take a few questions, but I do know that I need to keep to time today because we're busy. Okay, so one of the first things I did was looked at the dictionary definition of change. It was very simple, to make or become different. And uh, a number of the contract definitions that I looked at uh, just putting together this presentation are equally simple. It's such a simple concept. Anything that changes. We're also focused uh, in construction projects and need to be focused on what's actually in the contract documents. And as I said to you earlier, we regularly have problems where people come in and they haven't actually looked at the contract documents. That is, contractors who are looking to claim for changes and employers who are, who are unhappy that a change is proposed, actually digging into the original contract documents. Believe it or not, 10% of the matters that we get involved in, people can't even agree what the contract documents are. How can you possibly deal with change if you don't know what the contract documents are and aren't familiar with them. Sets out there the, uh, the drawings, specification, conditions, correspondence, maybe the tender. There'll be a list of things. And on your projects, I'm sure you all will be prepared to know exactly what is, um, is required in those documents and understand their content. So, <clears throat> as I said, recognizing change, that's fundamental, understanding what's in those projects. And also, when documents are exchanged during the course of the project, understanding the status of those documents that are being exchanged, correspondence drawings. Are they actually intended to lead to change? Are they just refining what's already there? Taking the literal definition, pretty much anything that comes out, any document, any drawing, could issue a potential change, or certainly be referred to later on when you're trying to evaluate change. And I've just set out a very simple diagram there of all the matters that you would take into account when you go through this process of recognition of exchange, uh, recognition of change. 
Understanding the subcontract documents is also important because some of you will be in the contracting space where you'll be looking at what changes down in your supply chain as well as how you present this up the line to the employer. So understanding that's certainly important too. You'll have some internal procedures. You'll have um, a process, no doubt, set out for change. Often, you'll have something that might be termed a change control team. Uh, and that sometimes troubles me a little bit, having a change control team, because it suggests that all the responsibility sits with those people for change, uh, which I don't believe it actually does. So I'll come to that in a little more detail in a moment. So I've already said, read the contract, understand that baseline. Once a change has been occurred and you've identified it, it's absolutely clear at that point that something is going to happen and a notification, a process needs to happen. I'll talk about the different forms of contract in a minute because they all have different types of procedures within them. But um, fundamentally, there are some really common process routes within the contractual mechanisms uh, that you'll find um, presented. Um, the contract may not always be followed. Anyone who gives you any advice on contracts will always say, follow the contract. Absolutely follow the contract. But in assessing a change, sometimes you'll find that the process has not been followed. And it's worth dealing with it head on, I think, at that point. And I'll pick up on that uh, in a moment. And constantly monitoring, you're going to do that, I'm sure, anyway, what the effects of change might be through your project controls, um, uh, setups, and establishments. You'll be looking at your drawings, your progress updates, your cost reports to see the effect of that change coming through. How many of you work on contracts where you haven't got a program when you start work? Absolutely essential. Oh, two, three, four, three or four people. Absolutely essential, the program. I think the program has gained in importance in recent years massively. When I first started in construction, it would usually be a few bars on the wall, possibly with a piece of string running from top to bottom in the site office with some drawing pins in it. Maybe different colored string if you were working for a top-end contractor. Um, but it wouldn't be anything as sophisticated as 10,000 lines of P6. I have to say, I'm not a big fan of 10,000 lines of P6, because when I looked at the piece of wool, I generally knew where I was. With the uh, black box scenario, with very complex um, uh, programs, which David mentioned this morning, that is certainly not always the case. So having a program, and having that program baselined at what the contractor is supposed to be doing at tender stage, reflecting the scope of works. NEC has some pretty good core clauses that set that out. All of the major contracts these days have some requirements to set out that baseline. But would you believe that when you move into dispute at some point in time, more than half the projects that move into dispute, no one can agree which is the right program to use? How can that possibly happen? How can that happen? But it does again and again. And part of the problem is nobody, when they set out on a project, thinks that they're going to fall out at the end. Sometimes projects are a little bit like relationships and you end up, uh, when you start dating, you know, you end up in that uh, preferred bidder status where you're going steady, yeah? And eventually you end up, you know, maybe engaged because you're, you know, you, you've got an early, you've got a letter of intent, maybe. <laughs> and eventually you might end up married, you might end up with a contract. And I can tell you now it's very expensive to get out of both of those things if you realize later on that you've made a mistake. Uh, change in the project team. I said earlier, change control teams, I think, are fantastic if they actually work and they do deal with the processes that are given. But formulaic processes produce formulaic answers. And I think you do need to assess in a wider sense whether they're the right processes. I'm not going to uh, go around the list there calling everybody out, but the message for me is that the whole team needs to have some focus on change. It's the thing that will catch you out at the end of the day. It's not just for that department, it's for the whole team, okay? And certainly linking design together into um, uh, the process and people understanding what the implications are of sending lots of drawings out um, just to see what, um, what, what the price might be for a certain scope of work. And then, I don't know, uh, do we have, how, can we show a hands for contractors? Yeah, I've yeah, got a few contractors in. How many of you have ever received a bundle of drawings which aren't bubbled or identified and had to play a fun game that I call spot the change. Anybody have to? 
We've all had that experience, haven't we? It just doesn't help the process when people don't follow those procedures that they're supposed to. But everybody on the team should understand what change is actually about. So, a lot of you are in infrastructure, some of you are in construction. I've got some construction examples of, of change problems that I'm just going to, to show you. Um, show hands for NEC, people who work on NEC. Some experts in NEC in the room. JCT. Yeah, good few. FIDIC, any of you worked abroad or working on, yeah, FIDIC contracts in the UK? Uh, PPC 2000, probably, is anybody into partnering these days? Does anybody still do that? You all go go-karting and then bowling together and put the thing up on the site office wall. PPC 2000, very popular in some sectors, particularly um, uh, social housing and those kind of sectors that, where people just uh, continuously collaborate yeah, and produce projects one after the other. A very successful project. iChemi, yeah, no, one or two people flickering with iChemi. There are a wide range of contracts out there and they all have their own definitions. Well, I'm just going to talk about change as encompassing all of them. So you can call it a compensation event. You can call it a variation, you can call it a relevant event, you can call it a relief event. It's all the same for me, really, it's change. And the message is every single contract envisages that every single project will change before it starts. Okay, so they all have some kind of provision. Although there are a couple of different uh, uh, differences between them, obviously, it's why people use different contracts. Each of those contracts has something in common. Okay, and I'm not doing clauses here, but there's more of you are on NEC than think anything else. But they will all have a provision that allows you to identify a change, to notify a change, to make an assessment of time, to have an automatic slide that shouldn't have been there, possibly. Let's go back to that one. So um, to allow you to notify, assess the money side, produce a quote, make a decision, and then implement. And also, implement can come up front. You can move the box that says implement Make sure I'm on the right slide, absolutely further up, and then do the assessment thereafter if that's what you want. But they all have that in common. It's a t very typical change process in the contract. They'll all have provisions, and it might not be directly clear um, when you first start looking at the contracts, but they'll all have provisions for records that need to be kept. Um, I, I think uh, there's a very famous quote, I think it was Max Abraham said in one of his books, that the, uh, the three things that people learn when a project goes wrong and they end up in an arbitration are the importance of records, the importance of records. And what was it? Anybody know what the third thing was? Absolutely, the importance of records. So having uh, set out what examples you're going to keep, the effects on the program, your labor returns, all of those bits and pieces, Believe it or not, a lot of projects we get involved in, the difficulties come from a lack of proper records. How can that be? We have computers. Um, I, I wrote an article a little while ago uh, called Smartphones and Smart People. Uh, it's online on the internet somewhere. And what I was really saying is, since we've moved over to phones from diaries, people don't keep a daily diary and a work workbook, a lot of people, like they used to. I certainly don't have a paper diary anymore. I used to write all kinds of stuff in there that I could look back on. Yet, the newer generation of people coming through, and I appreciate that's a sweeping generalization, I have seen people come onto site, uh, see a problem where something isn't fitted, take a video of it, walking around saying, this duck doesn't fit because of this, 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 and this, email that to the office, give it a reference number, send with it a point to uh, the project manager, so they've done the notification, all done with perfect records in their hand in a moment. So it's perfectly possible. So why do more than half of the people that get to the end of a project and have a problem not have good records? Just, you know, it's unforgivable really, isn't it? Uh, one thing I do sometimes say when I talk to groups of people is, most of you will visit a building site at some point in the next two weeks. That's the nature of the crowd that we've got here. Challenge for you, go and have a look at the project records. They should be there and available, whether you're an employer or a contractor, if you're keeping the records, it should be available for people to inspect. Go and have a look at the site diary for the last few weeks and see what it actually says. Does it say weather rather nice? Does it talk about the number of people that are on site or is that left blank? Just have a look. You'd be amazed at what, you, what you'll pick up from that. So there's a big difference between JCT and NEC and that was the two forms of contract that I expected you to work under. And um, 
That's loss and expense provisions. JCT has always had a loss and expense provision. And for those of you that haven't worked with it, I'll just explain what that is in a moment. Whereas the compensation event system in NEC assumes that time and money will be dealt with together at the same time in the compensation event. Okay? And of course, we've kind of moved on a bit from lots of building projects have moved on from JCT. Should we have a loss and expense provision or not? Show hands for it's a good thing. Show of hands for it's a bad thing. Show of hands for I don't really know, but I'd really like you to tell me. Okay. There's much more people in that middle ground there. Well, I think, I actually think it depends, but it's just, just uh, it's, it's the answer, to, of course, to most questions, is it? You never get caught out with a question if you say it depends. It also buys you a bit of time to think about what the answer might be. So loss and expense requires the uh, contractor to put in an application supporting why he wants loss and expense, and in JCT, it's the architect rather than the engineer. Equally, an extension of time can be requested. And this sits outside of the variations process. So you can assess this differently and separately. And the employers amongst you will be thinking, that's a rubbish system, because what you get at the end is a nasty surprise because you get a claim. And blokes like you draft them, and it really annoys me. That's what some people might well be thinking when they look at that. As to whether that's actually true or not, you can look at some of the challenges that might come along, and, and you, know, you can tell me whether or not you agree with me that's the case. So volume and value. I've got an axis here where I'm looking at the value of change on the bottom axis and the value of change at the top axis. And so if you divide a line between the two, in the bottom right-hand corner, let's make sure I'm the right way around, we've got a very low number of very large changes. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this off by also saying to you that sometimes, this is going to shock a lot of you, but sometimes projects go to site that are not fully designed. No, it's true. It's true. Sometimes, no, honestly, it's true. Sometimes that happens. And that means you're guaranteed to have a baseline of change before you start. My, question, my first question here is, is there a difference between the way you manage these two different scenarios? It's a clue in the body language. And uh, are there different problems that can arise from having those two different scenarios? So I'm going to look on the right-hand side. Let's say in the bottom right-hand corner, I'm building a motorway. For say, I'll just make an example here. And I have a new bridge, or the whole thing needs to be eight inches wider for some reason, or whatever. There's a big change. It affects a long part of that project. And in the top right-hand corner, I've got a building project which has hundreds and hundreds of small changes on it. Is the same change control procedure, is the same contractual procedure going to work in those two scenarios? There's lots of people shaking their heads. I think they're absolutely right with that. It can be real challenges here. Now, of course, if you end up in the bottom left-hand corner with no change, then you really have, if you're down here, you really haven't got to worry about it. If you end up in the top left-hand corner with an enormous volume of 500 massive items of change, you're in a whole different world as to where you might be. But the two most common scenarios that lead to issues are the ones I've set up here, and the most difficult to deal with is the one in the top left-hand corner. I've seen this on many projects, and I'll give you some examples in a moment. So low volume, high value, that's actually fairly straightforward because the employer wants an accurate number because it's a big change and is more than likely to allow the contractor an adequate period of time to price it. What would be the point of pressurizing a contractor to do that within four or six weeks if you think it should be 12? You know you'll get the wrong number. You know that the number that comes out that will be wrong will be higher. If you're a contractor and you're not quite sure and you have to make some estimates, are you going to go higher or lower? We could almost do a debt game here with Bruce Forsyth, couldn't we? Higher every single time if you don't allow adequate time. So really, dealing with this, the contract provisions, the contract mechanisms, I'm sure will work in, in any of those forms of contract we've discussed. This is all about adequate time and adequate resources to actually deliver the pricing of that change. So that sounds to me fairly straightforward. The project that, uh, I know there are several different um, uh, projects that I can think of here. There's one particular one which went to site, I would say less than 30% designed, and it was a refurbishment and change of use of a grade one listed Victorian building. OK? 
okay? Not something that you would go into without some forethought you might have thought. And I've picked a number, there are 5,000 changes. I think there were actually 3,500 changes that fell below 1,000 pounds, and the job went on for three years instead of 18 months, and ended up in an arbitration at the end. Now, some of you might be thinking, surely that never happens. Well, we have 435 consultants working full-time globally, doing nothing but this type of work. So if you haven't come across it yet, trust me, out there, this actually happens. And that's a really difficult scenario to deal with, isn't it? Because um, if, you, if you're doing changes in your projects at the moment and you're looking at your compensation event process, how do you allocate the true effects to those individual changes? If somebody says, move that radiator from there to there, that's quite an easy thing to do. You can price the actual cost, you can price the labor, possibly the, the defined cost, I would say, if you're on uh, on NEC, but actually when you've done that 50 times, there is an effect on the end date. But how do you pick that up in those individual tiny little bites? These are the kind of problems uh, that people experience. So in that scenario, as I've just said, every change is very minor of itself, but they do have a cumulative effect, and they have a big effect on the outturn of the project. So. Uh, you will probably have seen the various statistical studies. I've got some slides here which are uh, from the Leonard curve and from Horner and Talhouni. There are various different um, uh, scenarios out there you can look at. This particular one shows uh, a situation where we've got total man hours I've just put up on the screen of 150,000. Variations becomes 36,000 out of that total. Uh, giving you a percentage of change of 25%. You can see that down there in the bottom right-hand corner. Yeah. And if you apply that to the curve, you can see that, I uh, say the curve to the line there, you can see that that would suggest there's a 16% loss of productivity likely on that project as a result of that volume of change. How do you pick that up with move a radiator? How do you actually do that? How do you allocate that back? Is it even possible? If it is possible, should you even be trying? Another question that might go on the table. So other things that affect progress in projects, this one is about um, interruptions. So stop that and do this instead. Put that on hold while we decide what on earth we're doing and come back tomorrow and restart that particular work face. And as you can see, there's a curve. I did say there was no S curves, actually. I do apologize. Not, uh, not the type that you would normally see at project controls anyway. And you can see the duration of the uh, interruption is at the bottom, 0 to 7 hours, basically a working day, and ultimately a 0 to 100% impact on productivity as a result. So if you have a number of changes, how are you picking that up if you've got 25 or 30 changes this week? As a contractor, how do you recover it? As an employer, how are you sure you're not paying too much for these factors? Some real challenges in how you might go about doing this. There's another one here about the ratio of management. And I'm going to assume, let's assume that our project, um, and I'm very aware of the one I'm thinking of, that had more than 3,500 changes, let's say we had to put some additional resources on that job to deliver it because of the additional workload that was going on, okay, that additional uh, manpower. So then there's also an addition of the, the, the issue of managing those people, the management ratio that goes to that as well. And against productivity, again, you can see for concrete or steel structures, this is some standard data. I think this was done in the 70s, possibly um, uh, mid-70s, so it's not new data. There really aren't enough statistical studies going on in construction to give us up-to-date data. And of course, construction methods have changed. There's more equipment, there's more technology. We could really do with, and that would be a great thing for, for project controls, I think, to get involved in some point in the future, some, some up-to-date statistical studies. And you guys, you know, uh, as people who are interested in the industry, taking part in that, I think, would be fantastic because it would give us up-to-date data. But if you put more people on a job and your management ratio reduces, you could end up with a drop in productivity, which is what that particular job um, shows. Also, if you increase the number of hours in the week to try and get the job done or to try and do the additional work, there is a drop in productivity from that too. 
quite an interesting drop in productivity because I'm told that those who do a 50-hour week, right, which is the upper line, rather than a 40-hour week, which is the lower line, wouldn't that be nice to reduce down to a 50-hour week? That'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? Have the, have the weekend. But anyway, some people think that 40 hours should be the baseline. And the top line shows the difference in performance. So in the first week of working longer hours, there's a drop from 100% down to just below 90, about 87. And then people actually get used to working longer hours. And so there is an improvement, a slight bump. And then all the way towards doing that for three months, there is a drop off in productivity for people working longer hours. How do you pick that up in Moverad? form a new doorway? How do you actually deal with the volume of change that we're actually getting here? As you can see, there are some real challenges that, uh, that need to be addressed. The final, I do love a graph, you can see, it's probably, <laughs> it's probably one graph too many, but at the end of the day, it's nothing like a good graph in a presentation. And this is nothing, no, this is quite, I do quite like this. But this is about overmanning, basically, where you put additional workforce on. Maybe you're accelerating the work, you know, you're pushing on forwards. Of course, acceleration is the only clause in NEC outside of the compensation event clauses that's going to give you extra money or going to increase the total of the prices. You haven't got anywhere to go, bar that. But when you're pricing or when you're reviewing a contractor's price for acceleration, or, or let's, let's just say you're reviewing it, there is bound to be a drop-off in productivity if you have additional men on the work faces. I think that's accepted. Whether it's worth a pound or a million pounds depends on your perspective and your evaluation, but it's something that probably does need to be factored in when you're assessing change. Very, very difficult to do. This is why these effects, we all accept, I think, um, some people might not, I guess, we all accept that these effects actually take place. They actually happen. But when it comes to evaluating them on projects, very, very difficult to, to bring parties together so that they understand what the true effects are. Because equally, at the same time as all of that change, there will be something that I call visits from Mr. and Mrs. Cockup. Okay? There will be things that were built in the wrong place, holes that ended up getting filled in. Those of you like me that have been out on projects and done audits, every now and then you'll see an invoice for a breaker. What does a breaker mean? It means somebody poured some concrete in the wrong place, doesn't it? It means we paid them to dig a hole in the wrong place, we paid them to fill it with concrete, we paid them to break it out, and then we paid them to fill it back in with something else and put the concrete somewhere else. So those own goals need to be accounted for. And often employers will lose trust in the contractor's figures because they know that they have not necessarily accounted for the own goals at the same time as trying to account for the variations. So that can cause some real challenge. Hopefully that's not just a heckler. Um, drop off there, as I say, overmanning, big drop off potentially in effectiveness. So let's talk about what, how you might actually deal with this. And I have been, we, we regularly get called into live projects to deal with problematic situations. This particular one where there was a large volume of change, um, I came up with a suggestion which we actually adopted. And what I decided to do was to split it by discipline. Uh, there was a dry lining package, a mechanical package, an electrical package. This is obviously a, this is a listed building, so there's these trades working on the job. Okay? And then we also had uh, time. And you can do it daily, weekly, or monthly. We decided to do it monthly to roll up those changes. And we also allocated it by area. So to give you a graphic as to what that might look like, Identify, and this, will, this kind of strategy, I'm sure many of you will have used, can work on almost any project, where you're dividing up the uh, trades by the monthly periods, yeah, by the areas. So if, if that's the ground floor west, plastering in month one, and there are 20 changes, what I'm suggesting is a way through this is to wrap up all of those changes into one event in that month, in that trade, in that area. Okay? And that is a way of being able to sensibly assess all of those things I've just been talking to you about, about productivity, and of the actual likely impact on progress in your, in your program. If you've got a 10,000 line program, firstly, I'm sorry for you, but secondly, it's much easier in any program to identify the impact of a rolled up series of changes. You could do it bi-monthly, you could do it by any trade you want, you could just do the whole job. You don't have to do this sort of uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, array, this way of solving the puzzle. 
And I thought it was quite interesting that my sketch of how to solve the puzzle turned out to be a Rubik's Cube. Take that as you will. But if you're planning to do that, and, and this is what we did on this particular project, you cannot circumvent the project, uh, the contract. You must observe the contract. So a change has got to be agreed. And sending an email to someone saying, this is how I'm doing it, isn't it great, is not agreeing a change to a contract. It needs to be agreed at the right level by senior people who have authority to make that change and to agree to it. And if you cannot agree the change, you should not adopt the different methodology. You should always observe the contract. And off into the mire you will merrily go. So it's really important to have engagement between employer and contractor to try and agree those things. You also need the supply chain. On a big project where you've got some key subcontractors, they also need to agree to this different methodology. Whatever the methodology is that you might have adopted, get around the table and just suggest something, put it, on, put it down in writing, and agree it between the senior people concerned. I'd, I'd suggest agreeing it at employer contractor level and then dropping it down. But if the subs aren't going to give you the data, you are hopelessly lost anyway. Okay? So you do need to bring the supply chain into that as well. Go back to this. Are you using the right form of contract for the volume and value of change? Because if you went back to, I'm just going to stick with that at the moment. If you went back to JCT, you could price all of the work, the labor and the materials involved, and deal with the loss and expense at the end. Not ideal. Nobody knows exactly what the final account is going to be, but you're able to follow the contract that way. Had a client a couple of years ago who had a big contract with lots of change. One of the QSs sent to the employer's uh, QS a note saying, listen, I'll give you all the actual costs, but I've no idea of the impact on program. Uh, he didn't actually use these words, but I'll paraphrase. It's in the too difficult pile. Tell you what, let's agree it at the end, and let's call it CE 500 additional time. Okay? And they had a little chat on site. They had coffee, and that was how they proceeded for a year. In a year's time, when CE 500 came in at £2 million, the fact that I, I then said, well, these people are saying that change isn't agreed. They've accepted all of your quotes, all of your compensation events. You can't go back and open them up. How are you going to get the time? And they said, oh, don't worry. We agreed the change. CE 500's agreed. Show me, show me where this is agreed in writing. There you go. There's an email. I told him we were doing it. Show hands for, high, for anyone who thinks I told him we were doing it isn't a change to a contract. Absolutely. Cost of that mistake, two million pounds. Okay? Ch if you're going to change the methodology, change the contract and make sure you agree it in writing. Okay, sequential change. And this is, this is a topic that came up as part of the other topic, but I'm just, I think I'll deal with this because... Um, we've seen this scenario a lot on projects in London where there have been a, a, a volume of change. Do we have any architects in today? Anybody related to an architect or who would be offended if I criticised that profession? <laughs> architects do a great job. We couldn't, we couldn't go building without them. So let's say we're building something. Let's say we're building a stadium somewhere down the road, whatever it is, and we're in a rush on site to get things going, and we're reaching the floor slab completion, and we're going to go and build some block walls. And for those of you that are entirely new to the profession, here is a picture of some people building who are about to finish a floor slab and put some block walls up. I never like to go more than 10 slides without a photo, even if it's entirely gratuitous, but that sets the scene. So after a meeting on site... The architect comes to the meeting and says, you know, I think we can improve this layout and maybe we should do this differently and maybe we should do that differently. And there's a discussion about making some changes. No instruction is given. Let me be clear about that, okay? So we start off at the beginning of the meeting with this, okay? 15 minutes in, we've got some changes marked on the drawing. 10 minutes further on, there are a few more. And before long, before we've run out of coffee and donuts, there are all kinds of changes 
to this project, okay? So this block work layout is changing uh, as they think of new ways to do this because this design was rushed through, okay? It wasn't actually finished on this particular project. And this layout is really changing quite quickly. Let's say it's an NEC project. Now, all of you experienced NEC users would get a, an early warning notice out straight away saying, if you want to change this, you need to say now because in two weeks' time, this is going to be built. Okay, and it's wasted cost. So the first thing you do is get an early warning notice out. The number of people that are shy about issuing early warning notices, shocking, really. That's what they're for, you know? And I, I have conversations sometimes when we do a, a training on NEC, and I say, if this happens, you do an early warning. If that happens, you do an early warning. And somebody it will always say, the thing is, when you get on site and you send a wad, of 30 early warning, warning notices in the first week across the other, to the other side. Sometimes what happens is they come over and say, now listen, we've been through the honeymoon period and we are newly wed, okay? And during the honeymoon period, you were being nice to me and I hope you're not going to be mean to me now because all of this paperwork is a pain. And we're, we're collaborating. Some people will even say that they are living together in the spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. And that, <laughs> have you heard that phrase before? It's amazing how that can turn after a few hundred compensation event notices into the spirit, mutual spirit of fear and loathing. Um, but there you go, that's sometimes what happens. So um, people just say to me, well, you know, we don't really want to put all those notices out. And what I say to them is that what they should do is this. The person that's just visited them and put the arm around the shoulder and said, listen, you're not kicking off our marriage well. Go and sit with them, have a cup of coffee with them and say, listen, I don't want to do any of this because I love you and I trust you. You don't have to use those exact words if you think it would be creepy, okay? But you could do. You could say, listen, I love you and I trust you and I'm not going to give you any more notices. All I ask, all I ask is that you write to me telling me that you waive those provisions of the contract and you won't hear from me again, okay? I've never yet known anybody actually get that letter, but what they have found is the complaints about the volumes of notices suddenly drops and disappears because you're in a contract and you are obligated to observe the provisions of that contract, okay? So you've got to get those notices out. So the project manager can, at that point in time, instruct the block work to stop or not to start. But let's assume that he doesn't, okay? Because the project manager probably doesn't even know anything about this yet, okay? He's waiting for the architect's tweed jacket to hove into view in a couple of weeks' time and say, actually, I, I think I might change the block work or something of this nature, okay? He now knows about it because of the early warning notice. The early warning notice has gone out, so at least he's on notice that there's an issue. So let's assume that the project manager here is, um, is not going to stop, okay? But what he might do is request a quotation. And we've got some machinery now in the contract, haven't we, that's going to kick in when the project manager asks for a quotation request. And luckily for me, that transition works, okay? So under, I think it's clause 61, is that 61? I don't have my glasses on. Um, off goes a request for a quotation, okay? And you can have that quotation done with more than one option. You can, there could be two or three different ways of doing it, and the contractor could offer options, or he could be asked for options. And then the standard form of NEC, you're looking at a two week, uh, sorry, a three week period to allow that to happen. It's two weeks in the subcontract. And then, ultimately, the project manager's got to decide what he can do. He might say, yes, get on with it. He might say, actually, reprice it uh, or give me a quote on a different basis or give me another option. Or he might say, take no action. Not all project managers respond exactly on time. No, it's true. Obviously, none of the ones that are in this room know it's true. And basically, two weeks later, the contractor, if he doesn't know, he hasn't heard anything, has the opportunity to issue a notice himself, and if there's no response to that notice, ultimately, the quotation might well be deemed accepted. Okay, there are one or two exceptions to that rule, potentially. So I've got a process here. I think this is going to take five weeks, isn't it, to complete this process as standard? It sounds to me like about five weeks, and we're starting block work in two. Does that present a challenge? Our survey said, yes. Where will we be in five weeks' time? Should the contractor start to erect that block work knowing that there is a reasonable prospect that he is then going to have to knock it down? 
in a few weeks' time. Should he actually do that? Should he stop and wait? Build the walls that might, not got, might get knocked down. Should he go off ordering different size lintels? Because otherwise, there might be a stop period for procurement to actually do that. What should the contractor do? Should we show of hands for that he should pause until there is clarity. Yeah? Show of hands for he should crack on and build those walls. Yeah? Okay, it's an interesting 50-50 split. I'm going to go with crack on and build those walls. And I'll tell you why I'm going to go with that, even though it's the wrong thing to do morally and from an engineering point of view and from a building point of view, contractually, it is 100% the right thing to do because you are contracted to make progress. And if you stop and in three weeks' time, the project manager gets his printout, gets his estimate, looks at the, the quotation and says, computer says no, carry on with the block work, you've lost three, four weeks and you've got no excuse because you should have progressed it, okay? So you've been placed in that position. Okay, so <clears throat> the conclusion from me with that is that you should always follow the contract and progress works in accordance with the program. But there is always the opportunity in that scenario to go and see the other side and say, are we dealing with this properly? Are we dealing with this effectively? But my view in that scenario is certainly that the contractor should carry on and do the work as he needs to in order to, to finish that particular project. And if that involves pricing for knocking it down and building it back up, then fine. Final thought with you. Sometimes I think people try and do much in, in too much in one variation. And this particular variation comes in several different slices. The hold, possibly putting the works on hold for a while. The preparation, the ordering of materials, the setting out is an issue as well. The extra time for actually doing the work, which might include those lintels and the like, and then the finishes. And what I'm going to suggest to you is actually, if you break that variation down, for instance, if there was a no, an instruction to stop, that's a compensation event anyway. Why would you mix that up with the work? Leave it as a standalone event. That sometimes dealing with these things at standalone events, as you go in bites, rather than waiting until you have all the information, places everybody in a better position. So you could wrap them up, one, two, three, or you could wrap them all up together. So my conclusions are that the volume and value of change and the way you deal with it should be subject to change itself, okay? If things are going awry, if things are going differently or wrongly, talk to each other, talk to the parties on the contract, and agree a methodology that will work for this situation in this contract. But always record it in writing and make sure that that's agreed between the parties. Now, I've got a sign in front of me that says three minutes, but I think we've got time for some questions. Anybody like to kick me off with a question? How long do we have for questions? Two minutes. Anybody got a quick question? I'm around afterwards. This is Mike. Your microphone is about to arrive for you. Go back to the beginning of your talk, Mark. You were talking about the importance of the program. Yeah. Um, what is the difference when the program is bound into the contract document? Well, I think that the, the, I'd answer that with a question. And my question is, is it a good thing to have a program as a contract document? And the answer is yes, but only if it's a really good one. That's, that, that's my answer to that one, Mike. Anybody else before we close? There's a young lady just there. Uh, change management is a definitely a culture within yes. managing contracts and there's there's a very big swing between the um, we have to well the claim culture really bring your lawyers and your contract managers in before anyone else uh, and start registering your claims immediately and the I love you and want to be your friend and let's just work together on everything which yes. you would think one would sometimes leads to the other but how do you find that balance because as project controls and contracts people we're led definitely by the project managers either way and on, on how they want to manage when we know. That's a really good question. The answer to where you find that balance between the contractual and not is to, over, is to get everybody together at the start and agree how you're going to overcome those almost, they're pretty much, these are social issues. Where people don't want to confront difficult topics. They don't want to say, listen, you snore, I can't stand it. You're going to have to stop it or it's over. You know, they, they let things fester for a long while before they actually deal with them. And I think you've just got to cut through all the politeness and upfront say exactly what you mean. So it's about that culture of openness, 
Openness doesn't necessarily, it's not the same thing as collaboration, and it's not the same thing as calling in lawyers. It's just being straight with people and direct. Thank you. Do we have time for one more, or shall we call that a, I think, a, Okay, obviously such a clear talk that nobody's got any questions whatsoever. I'm around uh, for a little while. Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you.